very good morning to all of you and uh, it's a pleasure to start off this course uh, but it's also a very difficult task uh, to talk about trends in engineering education and the role of the teacher all of us all of you and me and all of us in the audience all of us have decided at some point of time to make a career of education and a career in engineering education so we teach various courses so i teach courses in the field of energy you may be teaching courses in software you may be teaching courses in civil engineering but we often probably do not step back to take a look at what we are doing what is our role how effectively are we doing what we are supposed to be doing what are the overall trends in the country what are the trends in the world and how does it impact what we do and see whether we can as a group be more effective in society first i'll try and uh, put down we'll try and see what is engineering education how is teaching in engineering different from teaching for some other disciplines then we'll try and look at some data and finally try to see what are the challenges and what are the kind of trends so i would encourage you to interject put your own views in between so that we can get into because you know it's it is not like we are teaching thermodynamics or i am teaching fluid mechanics where there are a fixed set of techniques that i have to teach here so it's we are trying to get a perspective and there would be a subjective element in it there will be some trends which are obvious to everyone there will be something which will be based on the way we look at the data so let's look at the first question is how is engineering education different from other streams how do we think what do we think of engineering education why is it why do we think it is different in what way is it different from the other streams yeah, it's more application oriented it's more application oriented okay anyone else want to add anything to that we do interact with the people those who are intellectually very good it makes a lot of difference between the audience or the students in the sense so you are saying that we are we get better we get very good quality students in engineering is that we, we get students who are very good intellectually and those are having high aptitude high aptitude to just sort of sum up I mean, most of the points have been covered but basic thing if you look at when you compare it with let us say a general education stream where we look at science arts or commerce engineering we are training people to play a role in a profession it's already decided it's a professional course like in medicine you know that the person is going to be a doctor here the person has decided to become an engineer so there is a link with a profession there is a link with a practice so we have to have unlike other courses it has to link up with what is the existing practices in industry what are the practices that we want to see in industry so in that sense it is different in the other sense that it has to have you would have much more in terms of equipment in laboratories and in other things so unlike the general education where we are just building the person we are also training the person to fulfill a role in a profession so that's that's one difference that i thought of uh, now the question is what is the role of an engineer in society what kind of training is required what skills and qualities are required for imparting this training right we do this without really thinking of all these kind of issues so let's start off by trying and see by seeing what is how do we define engineering I went on and googled engineering and got lots and lots of definitions so i picked up one of the definition which says that engineering is a profession devoted to designing constructing and operating the structures machines and other devices of industry and everyday life so basically we look at technologies systems devices everything which will make life easier for people in a broad sense and you also realize when you look at engineering 
many things in engineering whether we like it or not happen in terms of heuristics in terms of rules of thumb you start doing something then later on you understand why it happens you build a theory you model it and then you improve it so often some things just so that's another you know the state of art or the state of engineering depend keeps changing from time to time and of course look at various various comments people have on engineers i found one quotation which says that my advice is to look out for engineers they begin with sewing machines and end up with nuclear bombs so you have the entire spectrum of uh, things which come with engineering let's look at the type of roles that we all play as an engineering teacher and i try to see in the iit system if i look at undergraduate teaching and let's just see what are the type of things that we have as a teacher what are the types of roles that we play the first the most important role that always comes to mind is the, as an instructor of a course so in that course you have a clear cut objective you are trying to deliver a certain set of concepts techniques applications so that the students gain something during that course so that's as a course instructor then we have the laboratory courses where you are trying to show people how that actually applies in terms of experiments then we have a faculty advisor where we advise the students regarding what are the courses they should be teaching uh, taking what they should uh, specialize in then in many cases we have some component which links up with giving them an idea of what is happening in the industry around so that could be some kind of a practical training or a works visit in all our courses we have component of independent learning and that component comes out through the seminar or the project and this is another role that we have when we try to facilitate the learning independent learning of the students so that's that's another in in the iit system we have also introduced the ug research opportunities where students undergraduate students have the opportunity to interact and work on ongoing research projects some faculty members may be involved in the placement and may be helping in terms of seeing that people get the appropriate placement and in some cases you may also have interactions in terms of the hostel warden so you see the existing spectrum in terms of roles apart from this there are some administrative kind of roles that we so let's look at in each of these roles what is it that we do so the first we are disseminating information and increasingly this role is changing because right now uh, there is a surfeit of information available to people they just have to you know you just have to go there are online courses there are online books there you on everything you have material that is already available in other apart so you know and the nature of the information also keeps changing so you know it's a, there's an obsolescence which comes in so the emphasis on information dissemination itself that role of the teacher will actually is actually going getting that will decline then we teach certain techniques so that you know you, you look at uh, casting a problem as an optimization problem solving a linear programming problem and uh, doing a network flow various types of things where if you are given a structured problem people are able to take that problem and then solve that problem then there may be certain skills skill sets and this could be related to some experiments or carrying out things so we are teaching we are disseminating information we are teaching techniques we are teaching skills and these are the sort of conventional things that we think of but in the next two points are the most challenging ones we want to imbibe an interest and an ability to learn so that it's a lifelong learning process and we as teachers 
start people off on this journey where they are able to then independently learn as they go along because the nature of technology itself is changing and what we teach now after four or five years they would have to learn certain other things. So they, we, we build the confidence, the ability and the interest so that people can learn on their own and creativity and interest. Another issue which is there related to the profession is engineering ethic and very difficult, very difficult issue to sort of teach. We don't explicitly probably teach this, we don't have courses explicitly for this, but it's very important in terms of the profession. So the idea is it should be integrated into different courses and you, so that you can build up the ethics uh, of the profession. The two components which we look at in terms of an engineering, when we talk of teaching engineering, one is we must teach people to understand the existing practice, what is actually happening in industry. For that we need to understand the existing practice. However, we should not be rooted to the existing practice, otherwise if it is only going to remain like that then there is no change going to happen. So we have to understand how things work, what is the way we have the engineering practice and we also have to see and devise improvements and practices for the future. So this is, these two seem to be conflicting in that sense but we need to have a mix of these. That means we need to have what is the existing practice and we also need to see that practice need not continue in the same fashion. We need to be able to see in future what kind of changes, how can we make it more efficient, what are the types of things that can be done. And we have to train people who would initiate and bring about this change. When Jawaharlal Nehru set up the IITs, the mission that was put for the IITs was to bring about change agents, people who would act as catalysts for development and who would bring about science and technological changes which would impact and help the people of India. That is that's the type of thing and so that is the, that's sort of the overall uh, challenge in that sense. Okay. Now I will switch for the next half an hour or so, I will try to give you a quick perspective in terms of numbers. I have uh, recently been looking at some of the data on uh, engineering education in India and uh, there is a, the, I have a report which is there on the web, the link is there uh, in your references. So I would encourage you to take a look at that report in detail when you have time and send comments. But I will present only some parts of that report uh, quickly and then we will focus again on the challenges and the kind of issues which come out. So first thing is, let us look at engineering education as a black box. Okay? Look at engineering education as a black box, the inputs and the outputs. So if you look at the inputs, what are the inputs? You have the students, you have the faculty, the key components, students and faculty and then you have the infrastructure, the equipment, the building space and then the money funds, the resources. So if you look at all these inputs and this is the black box that you have, this black box is interacting with society as a whole and with industry and if you look at the outputs, education and research. How do you quantify the output? Education is in terms of numbers of graduates, number of B.Tech, B.E., postgraduates, PhDs and the outputs could be in terms of publications, journals, books, patents, technology. But really speaking these are things you can quantify but you see what is the impact on society. What is it that you develop and how do you improve society if you look at it in overall sense. But so some of these numbers I will try to quantify for India as a whole. Okay? And then we will try and see what are the kind of trends which are there. The interesting thing that we found when we try to look at this data is that there are lots of gaps. It is not you would try, you would think that it is very 
you want to know how many engineers graduate every year from India, you feel that should be a very easy number to find. Unfortunately, these numbers are not properly tracked. What we have easily available are the number of sanctioned intake. But numbers graduating, we have to do lots of, you know, we took some ratio, did all kinds of things and then got some estimates. We feel, we, we believe that these estimates are reasonably correct. But let, before we look at that, let's just take a his, historical view of engineering education in India. If you see, initially, most of the engineering colleges that were set up, Madras Survey School, which later on became the Gindi Engineering College. Then you have the Rurki, which was in 1948. And then you have the universities, which had engineering. Since then, most of the, in during the British rule, it was decided that we should have institutions which will be, get civil engineers essentially for the bridge building activity which was to be built. Then post independence, you had after the Sarkar committee, you had the IITs which, were, which came up roughly 1950-58. Initially there were supposed to be four, that became five. And then you had the NITs which were set up. And in 2007, there was the NIT Act which made NITs as the institutions of national importance. So this is sort of the typical timeline and interestingly, the women students were per permitted in engineering only around this time, 1949-1950. Uh, VJTI is set up at this time, just to give you a sort of idea. Okay, now let's look at the sanctioned intake. In 1947, at the time of independence, we had a sanctioned intake of about 2,500 engineers. In 1997, about 1.15, about a lakh of engineers, one lakh engineers. 2007, as per AICT statistics, upon about 5.5 lakh engineers, staggering number. And you know the growth rate, just look at this. this growth rate, you can calculate it, comes to we are growing at 17% per year, 17% per year, it's, it's a very high growth rate and that itself has several issues. Uh, now based on this, I have calculated taking the sanctioned intake four years before, taking the output to sanctions or output to the sanctioned intake ratios which you have averaged over different states and then calculated the number of engineering graduates. So we see that right now we graduate about in 2006 about 2.4 lakh engineers. It is a fairly large number. It is a fairly large number. And the interesting thing to note is that in 1947 we graduated 270 engineers of that order. Now it is about 2.6. Uh, 2.4 lakhs and you see that since the 1990s the growth rate is much the growth rate has been accelerated since the 1990s and this is primarily due to the private institutions that have been set up I have also put down the number of institutions engineering and in institutions and you will see that in 1950, there were only about 50 engineering institutions which were giving degrees. And that number now is about 1,500. Okay? In the last 10 years, of this 1,500, 1,121 institutes have been set up in the last 10 years. Okay? These are very important issues in terms of quality because basically what has happened is we have been increasing a large number of small institutes and uh, all this growth, all this growth, you see this, you see this curve, if you look at this curve, you can clearly distinguish that there are two parts of this curve. The first part up to here has a different slope and the other part has it from here onwards, this is where the private. The bulk of the engineers that come out 
are now from the private engineering colleges. The existing colleges, the IITs and the NITs are growing at much slower rates than the private engineering colleges. So the share of the IITs and NITs is really much, much lower. The IITs combined produce less than 1% of the India's engineering graduates. So unless this changes, you know, we, it can be an elite 1%, but if we are intact, we will be only marginal. And the NIT is also in similar. So this has certain implications in terms of overall. If you look at also, <coughs> you look at it in terms of the distribution in the states. What we've done is taken the engineering number of engineers being produced by each state, the sanctioned strength, divided it by the population of the state. So take number of engineers per million population. For the country as a whole, the average is about 213 per million population. Okay? And these three states, this color, this which you see over here, these are the largest, this is more than about 1000 per population, million population. Okay? And uh, Tamil Nadu has 1700, the largest state, Andhra Pradesh 1400. These are the number of institutes. There are 280 engineering colleges here, 208 here, and 128 here. Maharashtra has about 600, Karnataka 1,100. So you see that there is even a skewedness in terms of the regional disparity. The other issue which is there is if you look at, you look at the average number of engineering graduates coming out per institute, that turns out to be about 350 per institute, 340, 350 in that, in that sense. And uh, that number is not growing very high at a fast rate. What is growing is number of institutes. So our strategy has been grow a large number of small institutes. And you'll see smaller countries like the US in terms of population have engineering colleges which graduate 1,000 or 2,000 engineers. We with our population base have colleges which have 300, 400 in that sense. So the idea is dis distributed large number, what do we do in terms of quality, right? And look at China, you have institutes like Singwa which are graduating 3,000, 4,000 engineers large number of faculty base, you can concentrate all the resources. So that's one of the type of things which are there. Now let's look at, we talked of the graduates, but we also need to look at the specializations. Postgraduate, MTechs and PhDs, this is, these are the people who are going to contribute in terms of your research. We saw about 2.4 lakh graduates, about 20,000 master students. MTechs. That's the type of change. And you see that this has been the type of growth. And if I take the ratio, okay, masters to bachelors percentage, you'll see that there is some fluctuation. Of course, there are some uncertainties in the data also in this case because the output to student, the if you look at the sanction strength and the actual output, that ratio is much lower for the master student. The number of sanctioned output that we have, the actual output of MTechs is much, much lower. And you see that in the period where you have a very high growth of the BTechs, this ratio has been going down because the MTechs has not, have not been growing. Of course, there are lots of implications and there are, we have to look at industry, we have to look at the placement scenario, we have to look at several things, but these are the roughly the numbers. Let's look at the discipline wise uh, breakup. You see that the bulk of the uh, engineers, which were computers and IT, followed by electronics and mechanical, so that's the type of sanctioned intake. In, uh, interestingly, in the US, if you compare, the largest chunk is aerospace engineers. And uh, then it follows with different. And of course, IT and computers have been growing at a much faster rate than the others. 
Now let's look at the engineering PhDs. Again, there is uh, in this also there is an uncertainty in the data, and also you will realize that there would be fluctuations. Unlike in the other case where you have a degree-based time-bound program, but you will see that it's been growing, growing at much lower rates than the graduates or the masters, and roughly about a thousand engineering PhDs, 2.4 lakh BTECs, 20,000 MTECs, 1,000 PhDs. Let's see how does this compare with other countries. Let's see how does this compare with other countries. So that's what I put down, 2.4 lakh bachelors, 20,000 masters, and engineering about 1,000 PhDs. Also, the science PhDs are also important in this case, about 5,000 science PhDs, okay? Ratio of masters to bachelors, 8%. Doctorate to bachelors, 0.4%. Look at the US, bachelors about 75,000 for 2006. Of course, I have later on, I have been told that this number in the US, computer science and IT is not included in this. So that's considered as BS, uh, it's not put is along with the engineer. So if you add that up to this, this will come to about 1 lakh. And uh, 39,000 masters, so more than the, uh, about double the Indian masters, 8,400 PhDs, of which about 400 are from of Indian origin. Uh, yeah, if you look at the science and engineering total PhD is about 22,000, masters to bachelors about 50 percent and doctorate to bachelors around 11 percent. Even countries like the UK have about 2,000 2, engineering PhDs, South Korea around 2,000, Germany 2,000, Australia a small country has about 600 engineering PhDs. And so if you look at the doctorate to bachelor ratio, in every case these are of the order of two to, it goes from 4% to about 10%. China is the country which also has a low number, it's about 1%, but it's been growing at a very fast rate. So they have taken, they've taken separate large policy measures at the uh, national level to enhance this PhD and already this number is about 4,300. So this is one of the constraints. The other thing is if you look at bachelors per million population, are we overproducing engineers? That's another question which we may want to ask because what is the mechanism which links the demand for engineers and the supply of engineers? How well does it work? There is a perception that engineering is a good profession. So based on that, lots of people, lots of students at the 10 plus 2 level want to take up engineering. And that's why when we, we start a new institute, there are people takers. But then there is significant unemployment and underemployment of engineers. And of course, this is linked with the quality issue. But it's very clear that there is no, uh, the interface between industry academia and government which sort of tries to regulate this to see that the supply and demand is matching, I'm not sure if that's working properly, whether there's been much thought given into how this should work effectively. So you see that uh, you have the largest number seems to be South Korea about 1000 per million population and 200, but because one thing which we realize is that if you look at this 17% growth rate and if you keep on, it cannot keep on going at that rate, it has to stabilize at a particular point, right? So, okay, now let's look at what is it that our graduates are doing. So I will give you an analysis of the placement of IIT Bombay and of one NIT, SVNIT, Surat, okay? So I analyze the data for 2006 and you'll see that I was quite surprised to see, we looked at all the jobs that were, job offers that were taken, then classified the companies based on engineering, finance, consulting, software. And the interesting thing is 
35 percent of our graduates do take up engineering jobs and I thought I, I had expected this number to be even less but that's, 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 that's a fairly interesting uh, trend. The other thing is you will realize that the percentage of IIT students now going for higher studies has actually declined. The number is now between 10 to 15 percent. About 8 to 10 years back that number would have been 30 to 40 percent. The percentage of software jobs has also declined. About 5 years back bulk of people would have been taking up software jobs. Now finance and consulting seem to be preferences. Uh, dual degree program that means BTEC and MTEC there are about 50 percent of them take engineering jobs and the MTECs 57 percent in engineering. Um, so, so this is the type of thing. Let us look at also what kind of what are the average salaries. So, the interesting thing is we get there are lots of things that we can lots of data regarding our effectiveness of our engineering that we can try to get. But unfortunately even though it is very easy to collect this data we do not really document and collect this data and this is something that we should do because then we can track how we are doing. Otherwise we only, only have perceptions. So these are the average salaries and of course cost to company what they say and uh, you will see that the average salaries for BTEX from IIT Bombay in 2006 are about 5 lakhs per year. And uh, you will see that there is a clear difference with finance jobs paying higher than the engineering jobs and also paying higher than the software jobs. So that is that is why finance is you know there is a larger interest of students in finance. Dual degree students interestingly have got uh, a slightly on a higher salary compared to the BTEX. It looks like the average MTech salary is lower than the average BTEC salary that partially it is a chicken and egg problem but it partially explains that the MTech is not increasing at that same rate. In the PhDs actually a lot of the placements for PhDs occurs outside the campus. So this number is not this misleading. We have separately analyzed about 35 PhD students who have been placed from 2006 to 2007 and we see that the placement the average salary for that is about 7 lakhs. Now you see interestingly that finance average is higher than the engineering and uh, so, so that is that's the thing but this is giving you an order of magnitude. Now let us look at the data for SVNIT. In the case of SVNIT, fewer we will see that <coughs> bulk of the placement is in the software 50 to 60 percent and I have also looked at some of the private engineering colleges Manipal this uh, Manipal Institute of Technology I have looked at uh, the data for the Thapar Institute most of the good institutes you find that at the BTEC level almost all the placement 60 to 70 percent is in the software sector. That is so that has of course implications in terms of this. Uh, the other issue is let us look at the NIT's total you see we are looking at the output BTEX, MTEX and the faculty and then the percentage of even in the NITs you see that the between 30 to 50 percent of the faculty have a PhD. Okay. So let us look at this was just a quick um, idea of the type of data in the overall sense in terms of the engineering graduates and postgraduates and PhDs. Now let us look at what are the types of issues coming out from this. The first thing is if you look at many of our good engineering college colleges we have a very high selectivity. What does the selectivity mean? Selectivity means what percentage of the people who want to come for that course do we actually admit? You look at this for the best institutes, 
look at it for Imperial College or for uh, MIT or for Berkeley, it's going to be something of the order of 20 percent, 10 percent, 30 percent. In India, for the IITs, all the admission is through the JEE. The selectivity is of the order of 2 percent. For the NITs, the admission is through the AIEEE. Selectivity is again of that order of 2 percent. Even for the MTEX, if you look at the gate, again the selectivity is of the order of 2 percent. So, we are admitting only 2 percent and that that is a very, so we can discuss and debate the effectiveness of the JEE or the entrance exam, but the fact is we are taking only 2 percent of the people who are, so we are getting really a very select group and that is a big advantage and uh, it is much, much better than the anywhere in the world. Most of the international uh, engineering trends, the institutes are worried that not enough people are interested in engineering as a career. We have exactly the opposite problem. Um, the other thing is we have the share of the tier 1 institutes if you call the IITs and the ISCs, the share is marginal and also they are, we are not growing at any rates because we are concerned that our quality will suffer. But with the result that the nation is having this problem where you need to have the growth and the growth can only be the private colleges are willing to have that growth, but then the question is uh, the policy of a small percentage of masters and PhDs. We saw that less than 1 percent overall nationally. We can also see, we looked at what percentage of our PhDs uh, did an analysis of all those who were admitted for the PhD program in 2006, less than 2 percent of them have masters from IITs or IISC, okay. Less than 2 percent of our, less than 1 percent of our BTECs go for MTech or PhD and you look at any system anywhere in the world of their graduates, the best of the graduates stay in the system to do post graduation and you have those percentages in the Japan that is 70 percent, we are talking of 70 percent. In the US uh, some universities like Berkeley have a very high percentage 20, 30 percent, but we are talking in that terms. Here it is less than it is it's in the noise, you know, it is 1 percent. So, so that is that's a big issue because we would like to have, you would like to have research being done by motivated people who are actually the best of your selective people and that is that is not happening. The next issue is there is a faculty constraint. You look at that kind of growth and then you look at the type of faculty, the number of faculty which you have, I, we estimated based on this with roughly about 67, around 70,000 faculty members may be there in the engineering today. Of that, maybe about five, less than 5,000 would have PhDs. I mean, it is not necessary, PhD is not a sort of be all and end all, but the idea is do we, are we able to attract motivated people for the faculty and this is the uh, we look at the type of jobs, the software jobs seem to predominate. Of course, in the IITs that trend is changing and it is going more towards finance and some consulting. Issue is large number of small institutes, there are high growth rates, can we ensure quality? And what about the faculty constraint? What about the number of PhDs that we are producing? Where are we going to get the faculty from. So, these are the types of issues which come into this. The other issue which you, you would appreciate is that in general if you look at our ethos, we are not used to an engineering tinkering kind of ethos. You know when my, when something goes wrong with my car, I send it to the garage my mechanic does the thing. I do not, you know, uh, 
where pull up the bonnet and try to find out and try to do that. So I don't have that engineering sense inbuilt in me. And this is true about most of the people who come into the process. So the in an art Teaching also is more in the mathematical, analytical kind of things. The integration, the engineering feel is often missing. We are not able to enthuse people for a career in engineering. And the, the, we have a disadvantage because we have engineering is a preferred career option at the 10 plus 2 stage. So people often, without thinking, they want to go for engineering. And the question is, at the end of the four years, I teach a institute elective in the fourth year on energy engineering. And uh, I have people from mechanical, electrical, and we try to motivate and enthuse people, but people just have, they have switched off from engineering. And this is a very unfortunate state. You know, we say that our undergraduate students at the end of four years are not very focused on engineering. They want to move on to other things. but it is something that we need to be concerned about and we need to address. There are systemic issues that we can try to look at. Let's look at what are the type of international trends. The first trend <clears throat> that you will see when you, I'm just presenting these in terms of issues. The first thing is globalization. So one of the concerns, especially in the US, is that they perceive that all the engineering jobs are going to go to US, uh, to India and China. Things are going to be outsourced. Uh, also, companies are looking at their, you're having mergers and you're having larger companies, companies having presence. So, you, there is a conscious effort to have a mix in the student body where you have international students. And for the students, you also give them international experience. You also have the situation where international colleges are trying to set up in different countries. And that's also the globalization of education itself and the globalization of the engineering profession. So this is one of the trends which is there. How will it impact us? In various ways, but this is one of the trends which we need to. The second issue, if you see, most on most engineering colleges and institutions, one of the issues which is coming up is the issue of diversity. Engineering is typically still a male dominated profession. And most of the places, most of the countries have realized that in order to make it, to uh, order to enrich the engineering profession, we have to consciously try to s encourage more women to come into engineering. Uh, if you look at the numbers in India, about 20% of the graduate engineers are women. And that number has been increasing. This, uh, interestingly, in the US, it's about the same amount. It's about 20, 21%. It's within the uncertainty band. They're all in the same range. Uh, in the IITs, it's a little less. It's about 9%. And if you look at amongst the IIT faculty, it's about 10%. And uh, so, Again, there are, this has been flagged as a major issue and if you look at, there are sites which talk about, so there are institutes which have policies to try and increase this percentage. So if you look at the Rensselaer Polytechnic and uh, interestingly, you have, you see that uh, I know of at least the Renis uh, RPI and MIT two who have uh, presidents, college presidents who are women, women engineers. And uh, so it, it, it is an issue which is in the forefront, being discussed, being analyzed, looking at trends, looking at career paths. Uh, it's not so much in the focus in the Indian context. This is something which we need to think in terms of how to bring in that focus. The next issue is that if you look at engineering education, we've been, we've compartmentalized knowledge into different departmental compartments. And unfortunately, now we are realizing whenever we are looking at a problem, we have to cut across these 
departmental compartmentalization. So we need to look at interdisciplinary kind of approaches. So we need to have in our system certain flexibility so that people can take different types of courses. And if you look at engineering education, you have analysis and you have synthesis. So you break it down and you try to look at the individual component and then you try to do that. So we are good at doing the analysis, but this integration and synthesis, when you build it up, that is often missing. And that is also these links we teach in mechanical engineering, we'll teach fluid mechanics, we'll teach heat transfer, we'll teach strength of materials. But then when you put it all together and look at a real life problem and how they all match and link up, that integration is often missing and we leave it to the students to get that and often they don't get the whole perspective of what is happening. And that's, that's one of the issues. The other thing is if you see the trend, uh, the trend has been with our development in terms of we now have characterization equipment. You have the transmission electron microscopes which can go down and you can see the material at the nanoscale. We are able to understand how, the, how we can modify material at a very fundamental kind of level and nanotechnology and nanoscience has also, this has implications in terms of, you know, we earlier used to talk of micro and miniaturization and we were going right down. It has implications in the way engineering will be done of systems in the future. So nanotechnology and nanoscience, what we are saying is that if you are looking at anything to the level where the characteristic dimension is nanometer. That means 10 raised to minus 9 meter. Now you have the characterization equipment where you can actually look at the material and take and see what is the structure at that level. You then also have machining and processes where you can modify it at that level. And then the whole basis of engineering then changes. And this is where research is going into. Also, if you see, historically look at any engineering subject, you will find that we start off being different from nature. We start doing various things and we, we believe that, you know, we can change nature, we can do. Then nature has a way of catching up with us. The nature of research is such that individual researchers or individual institutions will not be able to make the kind of impact and will not be able to take everything. So you are going to have lots of research collaborations and that's that's another kind of. Okay, I have given you in your handouts a comparison of different universities, maybe right at the end, different universities in terms of their outputs. Uh, it tells you number of engineering graduates, number of uh, MTechs, PhDs, I had a lot of it took, took a lot of time to construct this one table that you see because you will not find any of this information in one place. But I would like to just plot, I wanted to take this plot and look at, see we are most of our that 1500 colleges that we talk of are mostly in the business of teaching. And as we start teaching if you look at it, you have a category if you look at private colleges you could be affiliated colleges, right? Colleges where you don't have much flexibility, neither academic flexibility, you can't change your uh, syllabus, you can't change your exam pattern, and you don't have too much financial flexibility also. Next is as you evolve, you become an autonomous institute, and then you become a deemed university. That's the typical type of progression. And as you try to make this transition, you also try to make the transition from teaching only with undergraduate, and you start doing postgraduate and teaching plus research. IIT is also where well, initially just teaching, now teaching and research and we are trying to emphasize more on research. So if you look at it, there are different metrics which we can talk of. You talk of publications, you talk of patents, you talk of output. I have taken only two of these metrics to draw a graph to illustrate some of these issues. So I have said that let us look at the undergraduate student output per faculty. That means, B.Tech 
per faculty on the y axis and publications per faculty sorry uh, x axis ug engineering degrees per faculty and publications per faculty again i thought a lot before putting this i thought of putting adding up ug plus pg plus phd but then i said that the masters and phd should actually contribute to research so let us not take it in terms of the institution is providing a service in getting engineers out so and while the masters and phd is also helping in terms of research so it should show up on the publications if i increase the publications that is the type of thing so if you look at it these are the different so let me just show you so essentially if you look at this line as a cut off one published peer reviewed paper per faculty per year okay and <coughs> this is the and the publications per faculty the average goes up to 5 6 and if you look at number of engineering degrees again going up to 5 6 so you see that predominantly if you are teaching we can decide to have more output in terms of students ug students so if you see the typically the nits or many of our engineering colleges of the order of 3 or 3.5 per faculty ug students per faculty you can do a simple calculation for your cal college just divide the total number of graduates by the number of faculty that you have and you get this and if you want to look at the student faculty ratio multiply this by 4 you roughly get and the aict norm is about 15 so that means somewhere in this range we are somewhere in this range and almost that 1500 colleges that you we are talking of almost all those colleges will be lying in this band somewhere here somewhere in this band okay so now as we de develop one of the things that we always complain about is we have lot of teaching load lot of teaching load but the fact is you will see that there are colleges perdi university national university of nus singapore georgia tech singwa university they have much higher they are in the same range 3.5 to 4 ug students per faculty and they have publications per faculty of the order of 3 to 5 papers per faculty per year so it is not a what we believe is not necessarily correct we always try to think essentially what happens is we try to say that we are getting teaching load and we are going to have more if we increase our student output our research is going to suffer there is an optimal mix so you can actually have if i have an institute here i can take all these three pathways if you want to go from teaching only to teaching plus research you can go in this direction which is let's say for instance many of the iits we always often like to model on caltech caltech has very few ug students and you look at isc very good in terms of publications per faculty but it's a post graduate institute no ug output of the order of almost 2.93 the iits are of the order of 1.6 papers per faculty per year and you look at the ug output per faculty of the mit is greater than the iit system even though the papers are so it's uh, you know when we try to sometimes we are we have this ratio 1 is to 9 for the iits 1 is to 15 for all other engineering colleges uh, these are not sacrosanct numbers we can have colleges with 1 is to 25 1 is to 30 which still have much better research output so we need to look at overall look at the trends and the interesting thing is instead of creating a large number of small institutes and not bothering about quality the existing institutes which are which are showing some track record can be strengthened and they can increase so that you have a campus where you have 10000 15000 students and so that that's that's that is another kind of uh, possibility which is so this is uh, the korea advanced institute of science and technology this is the tokyo institute of technology 
this Singhua in China, this is Singapore. So I tried to get as many Asian data points as possible. This is Postech also of Korea, more a, science, a research institute at the po and this is Caltech in the US, MIT in the US, Imperial College in the UK, Georgia Tech in the US, Purdue University in the US, Singhua University of China, Manipal Institute of Technology, Manipal, uh, the, all the NITs averaged, this is the IITs averaged. Let's also look at the, uh, you look at the, this is from, uh, uh, from a paper by Boyer, Boyer's model of scholarship, you see that if you look at your own role, main responsibility, the scholarship of teaching, but in addition to the teaching, you have research where you are we are discovering different things about science and engineering that we are doing. And then if we are involved in application, that means we do consultation, professional consultation in terms of contracts or personal con consultation, we do continuing education can consider it as community service and you have an outreach. This helps us understand the engineering practice and how our teaching sort of links up. So it integrates, this is a scholarship of integration. So all of these together improve our effectiveness as an engineering educator. So you know there's a, there's a mix, optimal mix of this. So it's, it's a good idea to get involved in looking at the rest of things. But what are the challenges that we face? First challenge that we talked about, the challenge of motivating students. Very uh, easily said, very difficult to do. Um, increasingly, uh, students have, the aspirations of students have changed and their exposure, their ability to get information, they have much more sources of information. So the challenge of motivating the students and the next thing is integration and practical applications. So uh, often, you know, when we try, I've tried variety of things. For instance, in a course on energy management, at one point I divided the course into several course projects where we took up the entire campus and we did an audit. Each group had to do an audit of the campus and then present their results and uh, do things like that. In another course, we actually had industry projects where they would go out into industry and try to do, but with limited success because finally what happened is the industry was not happy with this. We had to finish off those projects subsequently with our own time and effort because different groups did it with different kinds of. Um, some of the interesting things is I, I can give you an example where we have, uh, we had three MTech projects, three different students working on different subcomponents of a problem and that problem was simulating the turbine governing system of the 250 megawatt Dahanu power plant. And at the end of these three projects, they got a, they built up a simulator, which was transferred to, uh, at that time, BSES, now it's Reliance Energy. Uh, in that case, in this case, the project worked because all three of these students were ex-BSES people. So they had the interaction and they got along well and we had six faculty members uh, interested. Uh, so the other thing is we have very, uh, you know, if you look at, any field that you have, there are so many real life engineering challenges and problems in the Indian context. Industry linkages, much talked about, happening, increasingly happening, but much more can be done. So whether it is in terms of projects, whether it is in terms of internships, whether it is in terms of in the IIT system we have something called the adjunct faculty. So we have people who are from industry who come and spend time. The other challenge is the obsolescence of information. So with the result that you know we need to understand that it is not really so important for us to cover all the information about you know about production engineering or the types of things that we are going to do. And we, we need to just 
build up, show the history, show certain concepts and see so that people are able to pick up different things as they go along. And we talked about interdisciplinary and then the issue of transition from an education institute to a research institute. And finally, the idea of responding to the changing needs of the society. And this is where the linkage with society, not very, again, not very, very difficult to really quantify, but something which we need to really uh, do. Uh, coupled with this, there are changes in the way we communicate. So, the conventional chalk and talk getting replaced initially by overhead projector, the LCD projector, the video classrooms, you have web enabled courses. And you have, for instance, very interesting things like uh, the web assisted uh, teaching. So, for instance, we use, routinely use now a software called Moodle, where which enables us to upload all the assignments, the lecture notes, we can have, uh, we can interact with the class through the, uh, through this software and uh, people can uh, see each other's presentations, comment on it, you can evaluate. So, these are sort of things which, of course, uh, we don't need to overemphasize finally the effectiveness is not just a function of, there are studies which have shown, there is an interesting paper if you see on the web, uh, Professor Felder I think, death by PowerPoint he calls it. So, he says that he was an effective teacher and then he started doing everything on PowerPoint and then the teaching and evaluation sort of started going down and then this, he makes a set of rules of what you should do with. There is a, you know, there is a interesting thing that you can do when you do on the chalk and talk and you people are with you and certain things. So, you have to have a mix of a variety of things which is fairly obvious of course, but uh, increasingly if you want to increase the numbers, suppose we have a constraint of faculty. We know that we have a constraint of faculty, we want to include to improve quality. It is essential that we need to learn to interact with a larger group of students and do this more effectively. And there's so many of these techniques can be uh, used. Uh, there's a paper, I've given you a reference that there, there's a study in, in MIT in the aerospace department where they tried a number of active learning techniques and they studied their effectiveness. You can take a look at the paper, it shows uh, one of the interesting things, you see they prepared lecture notes, putting them on the website, uh, lectures, lectures of course turn out to be still the most effective kind of thing, subject web pages, in class exercises and they have this concept of muddy cards. The idea is in each lecture, you, you hand out cards to people and the last three minutes of the lecture you ask people to hand in what is the muddiest concept, that means what is it that you didn't understand in the class and then you take all that and then you incorporate. So, it becomes a sort of, you do not wait for a end feedback or a middle feedback. Of course, if it is a small class, you can probably do this without, you know, it is just a way of getting feedback. So, that is, we can, you can look at this kind of. But the, the important thing is, if we, apart from thinking of the content, if we think in terms of the delivery and the effectiveness and as a faculty discuss and see what are the ways to make this effective, what is, the, how effective are we in teaching, uh, you, it can really make a lot of difference. And so, often we do not step back and, you know, sort of analyze it, we just go on with day to day, so that is the type of. Uh, there is a paper by Felder which talks of the skills that we do not teach in engineering and you see skills to think innovatively, holistically and entrepreneurially, design for aesthetics as well as function, communicate persuasively, bridge cultural gap and re-engineer ourselves to changing market conditions. Okay. Uh, I would just like to, coming to the end of the talk, I would just like to bring one issue, uh, this transition from education to research also has a change in an attitude. Now, I was involved 
as the associate dean of R&D, I was for three years, I was looking at R&D and IPR issues, interacting with companies and other things. And uh, it's very clear that the model that you have when I teach and I educate, my student comes to me, he's in industry, he has a problem. He, he spend, I spend an hour with him telling him, okay, why don't you try this, why don't you try that? And it's an open model. I am interested in disseminating information. I am really not personally interested in the rewards which come out. That's the classical model of the teacher. If you look at the researcher, researcher is interested in making a mark in research, finding out, and then then inbuilt in it is a competitive nature and inbuilt in it also secrecy. Often you are doing research for some companies, you have a non-disclosure agreement. I have been in uh, NTEC assessments where certain things people are reluctant to disclose. They say that's part of, you know, uh, we cannot evaluate, uh, we cannot disclose this because that's likely to be patented. So this is one of the issues which is coming in. When we think in terms of getting research, research for industry, for business, are the issues of intellectual property rights, who owns the intellectual property rights, what are the type of things which is there, how do I commercialize it, how do I go for the business interest. And my contention is that these two attitudes are at conflict. The attitude of an open teacher where we try to disseminate and the second is where I want to I want to find something and once I find something I want to capitalize on that and convert it into a commercial product. And as I do that I want to make sure others don't know about it. So this is the, uh, and we have to understand that this conflict is, you know, this is, this is an inevitable part of the conflict at the, in different individuals will be at, will have a different mix. Some people will decide to incubate their own businesses, power to them. There will be some who will say, no, I want to only do education. But at the institution level, we need to have policies to resolve some of these conflicts which will come up. And such conflicts are inevitable. We have to understand that this is, these are inevitable. And we have to keep the overall institutional goal of education in mind, as well as a certain percent which will go for your uh, business and research. So this is, this is one of the things uh, which is there. Well, this is from one of my colleagues, his signature, uh, he's from Crescent. I, li I like this quotation and I thought I'd just end with this. Uh, see, if you look at the society and the problems of society, there are so many things that engineers can do. And as engineering educators, if we can build people who have that kind of vision, who have that interest, in doing that, that's 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 really the role that we sort of see. And uh, okay, these are the references. I would particularly request you to take a look at the report. We w I would uh, really appreciate comments from that report. There's much more in terms of data than what we have have shown here. Um, so I've just tried to put down my spin on the whole thing. It's. It, I thought it was a very difficult task, so I, I hope something has come out of it. Thank you for your patience.